Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Artists of Color. I am Elaine Hall Corbin, your host, and I'm going to say something very funny tonight. If you're interested in the way I look, it's because I've been in the rain. So I want to thank you all for joining me this evening. And I have a very, I know, I always say a very special guest, but all my guests are special. But these are, this young man, I will say young man. Thank you. Is one of, <laughs> one, one of my favorite artists. I've known him for a minute. And I want to introduce you all to Shea Justice. Good evening, Shea. How are you? I am doing well. Doing well. Very glad to be here. Ah, thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Mm. Uh, as we can see, we've got nice weather today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting here was a nightmare. It, I'm so sure absolutely. it was. I know it was one for me because I, it's funny because when I got off the bus and I walked here, mm. I was soaking wet by the time I got here just from the bus stop. Wow. Yeah, and it's like, it's only like a block. And the rain was just, uh, the scary part down. of the trees when the trees fall. Yes. And things, that's the scary part. Shay. Yes. I want to talk to you about your artistic career. Okay. I first want to know, where are you from? Where, in other words, I know you're Bostonian, mm -hmm. but tell my audience where in Boston. I love telling people, have people to tell them. I was born in Roxbury, Massachusetts, huh. over on Irwin Avenue, not that far from uh, Packy O'Connor's, the Irish bar that used to be over there yes. just before you hit Grove Hall. Um, I've lived in different parts of Grove Hall, uh, Blue Hill Avenue, Geneva Avenue and Dorchester and different areas, um, Roslindale, and now I live in JP. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, of all the places you've lived, mm -hmm. what do you like best? Do you like Roxbury, or do you like where you are now? I like it all. I don't, I'm happy where I'm at now because it's near the T, and I can just jump on the T, and I don't have to drive and risk catching tickets because this is a city where it doesn't take a lot if you have a car to get a ticket for that's right. Doing something if you go downtown, so I can just catch a bus. Um, I like it all. I appreciate it all. I don't. I get nervous when I see a lot of the um, the giant condominiums and skyscrapers being built because I just feel like gentrification is going to remove it's, it's and displace. Here. Yeah, and displace a lot of folks, and so that scares me a bit. Me too. But um, I, I enjoy it. Oh, good. Yeah. Well. I want to tell my audience, we're going to take a very short break and we'll be right back. Hey boss. You okay? Yeah, I'm good. You sure? I said I'm fine. Since I was little, it was only like me and my parents. You think you created family out of characters? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm going to take that and make it into a song. Hey, son. Hey, Bob. You can talk to me. It's been really, really hard for me. 
Good afternoon. Welcome back to Artists of Color. I'm Elaine Hall Corbin, your host. And my guest today is Shay Justice. Glad to be here. Artist and educator. Yes. And we were talking earlier because I didn't know that he was an educator educator. Like I had no idea where you, you know, where you taught. Mm -hmm. I knew you were in the Boston Public School System. Yeah. But then I was like, where did you teach? And then you told me. Initially, Lincoln when I, Sudbury, and I said, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Initially, I taught in Fort Lauderdale, Florida for a couple of years, and then I taught elementary school at uh, Royal Palm Elementary School. Then I moved back up here. I, I wasn't, I, I didn't feel comfortable down there um, for different reasons, and so I moved back to Boston. I taught at Fenway Middle College High School when it was at Bunker Hill Community College for a few years, and then I ended up at Lincoln Sudbury, and I've been there ever since. You've been there ever since? Huh, yeah. Uh-huh. 24, 24 years now. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's funny, you were talking about, uh, what, uh, Fort Lauderdale? Yeah. I was in Fort Lauderdale for the very first time back in 2019. Mm -hmm. I wasn't comfortable there either. <laughs> I went there because I was getting ready to get on a very big ship to go on a cruise. Mm -hmm. And that's where we had to go and then get, get a cab or a bus to Miami. Uh, to get on the ship. Uh, my very first cruise, and I said, I'll never do it again. But anyway. <laughs> Haven't done one yet. Oh, and you, well, you know, hmm? I did my first, and it's probably going to be my last. Uh, too much scared of water, seasick, things like no, that? No, I wasn't seasick. It's just that the water doesn't taste very good on that boat. Uh, you know, you, you might not want to taste the water. Mm -mm. Yeah, probably not. Mm -mm. Oh, terrible. When you, you, you said, you, well, I'm going to go back to you, mm -hmm. you talked about teaching. Yes. And, you, and you've been teaching for, what, 24 years now? Since 1993. What, what, do you, what, do you, what were you teaching, or what are you teaching? Are you teaching art? I teach um, art, drawing and painting, to okay. um, high school students, and advanced drawing and painting to high school students. For about 18 years, I taught it, in the summertime, I taught at College Academy, um, which was a summer camp run by a good friend of mine, um, Tony Biscardi uh, years ago. And at that, I taught like the little middle school, elementary school kids for um, about 17, 18 years, something like that. Okay. And that's out in Winchester. Oh, Winchester, yeah. okay, out there, on those parts. Mm -hmm. Did you like it out there? I mean, teaching, were they- Oh, I like, all, I like kids of all you ages. You love children anyway. Because when I was in Florida, I taught elementary. Okay, yes. And I'm certified to teach pre-K through 12. So I don't have a problem with age groups. I, I enjoy kids. Did they like your technique te technique of teaching? Did you, I mean, especially the high school students. I know the little ones oh, yeah. probably wouldn't because they're saying, hey, it's no, fun they all, they all do. When you try to look at what kids want or, or what kinds of things would grab their interest, um, I think sometimes the challenge is to try to get through to certain students who, there are always people who just in their mind, they say, I can't draw. And they, they're unwilling to really facilitate or, or really get themselves to take risks, make right. mistakes. A lot of times people have the perception that being able to draw just means you can look at something and render it so accurate and so perfect that means you can draw and it makes you an artist. Yes. Whereas there's so many other aspects to being an artist than that. And that's something that me and my colleagues at Lincoln Sudbury, we, in, the, in our art department, art department, we try our best to make sure that the kids um, have that confidence and that they're not worried about this drawing is better than better this than drawing, that drawing so that kid I is better than you that. and all that. Yeah. yeah. Especially you have to let them know that that's not the grading criteria. Right. That, oh, this one's better than that, so he gets an A and you get a C and that kind of stuff. Very good, very good. Yeah. When, did you dis when did you discover you were an artist? That's a very interesting question. I, I like that kind of question. Uh, because I, I talked about it recently at Spoke Gallery. Um, I had an exhibit at Spoke Gallery in South Boston. Um, when did I discover it? Probably when there used to be this TV show called Drawing from Nature with Captain Bob Cottle. I remember that show. And every Saturday morning, it came on at like 5.30, and he'd say, you know, okay, boys and girls, we're going to draw the horseshoe crab. Yep. And then he'd start <laughs> drawing on a big piece of paper. And so when I used to go to my Aunt Jane's house out in, um, near Warren Gardens and spend the night with my cousins, um, I sometimes would get up in the morning and she'd give me index papers or typing paper or something to draw and try to follow along with some of those. 
And what ended up happening was one point I mailed one of them to the show because yeah, at the end of the show, he does, he did a pan. So you got to see viewers drawings that were sent in Yes. and mine's was sent in. And oh. I had to have been about six, five or six. And okay. I just knew, I mean, school, I saw things differently than the other kids and just, I loved comic books and trying to draw comic, comic books. And my next door neighbor, this guy, Wendell Sullivan, he was a little bit older than me. He could draw so well, and he just was like my idol as a kid. So I was like, I want to draw Batman and like Iron him. Man like he does. And eventually I started to do that. But he was a major influence on me as a little kid. Oh, he was? Oh, yeah. Okay. Wendell oh. Sullivan. I always got to drop that name. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Very good. At least he was, an, he was an influence. Yes. And he was a good influence. Mm -hmm. What are some of your other inspirations? Dana Chandler. Because ah. when I grew up in Grove Hall, um, his murals were all over the place. Yes, they were. Down Dudley, when there was a Nubian Notions, yep. he had that um, mural, Knowledge is Power, the power. in school. Yep. Um, the, the mural in Grove Hall with the guy wearing a construction helmet, and he had the fingers yes. with the saws and hammers. Yep. Everyone knows that picture, too. Thank that, you. Th that mural. And just, he's always, and I'm so lucky and blessed, I'm friends with him, too. Um, he grandfathered me into the AMARC program. Beautiful. And so we've been friends for years. I'm friends with his brother, Jeff. Okay. And just talking with him and his, his, his thoughts, his, create, his creative process when it comes to politics and racism yes. and stuff that he addresses in his work. In his work. It's always been a source of inspiration to me in my work. So I always think about Dana Chandler as well as Paul Goodnight. Ah, I'm good friends with Paul Goodnight My two as favorite well. people. Ah, love his work to death. Paul is and just amazing. Inspiring, oh my God. very inspiring yeah, artist. Well, he's, he's, mm. my next, he's my next guest. He's really? Come, yeah, I'm going to do him the beginning of the year. Okay. Yeah, every time I see him, I love him dearly. Mm. Every time I see him, we talk. And I keep, I, matter of fact, he did a, um, he did a class one night over at um, Mass College of Art of art one night about a year ago, I think. Okay. I think it's about a year ago. I sat in on one of them about four years ago. Maybe it was that, that he long was doing. ago. It was a while ago. But yeah, I sat it was in a while it. ago. And he I sometimes, was in that, I was in at the place. piano factory, he has drawing sessions. He does. There. Sometimes at the gallery, sometimes in his, in his, in his apartment, studio. Yeah. And um, I've, I've always, every time he asks me, I always participate in them. I try. <laughs> I try. I tried. Mm -hmm. By the time I looked at it, when it was done, and Paul would come over and he'd look at it, he says, he says, not bad, not bad. I said, it's ugly. <laughs> I said, it's not, it's not what you did. He said, it's not supposed to be what I did. Yeah. You know, because I've always wanted to draw mm -hmm. and make figures. Um, I don't have it anymore, but I remember the first time I really tried to do an, uh, a really a portrait. Mm -hmm. I tried to do a portrait of my daughter when she was like about two. Mm -hmm. It looked like her, I have to admit. It really looked like her, but I said, there's something missing. Anyway, I, um, I want to, I want to talk about some of your work. Okay. And we have some of your work here, so let's bring up, explain. Uh, that is from the Shaw Memorial at the State House. Right. Um, I did that several years ago as a rendering um, because I was, I, I want, at initially, and I still want to do this, I was really bothered by if you go to Faneuil Hall or a lot of areas in Boston and you're a tourist, there's not many visuals around or many items if you're a black tourist tour in Boston Thank that you. you can buy and bring home. Right. Black, white, whatever, but black specifically. And That's so right. I started doing a lot of illustrations, hoping to make some connections with people, and I still do, that could do some manufacturing, put these kinds of things on T-shirts or yes. context of some books or something like that. So that was one of my initial drawings. I like it. Thank you. Yeah. And this one? This is one of my sketchbooks. Um, I have several sketchbooks about American history and mm. my observations about American history. Um, I've been doing critical race theory before it even became controversial. For me, ah. critical race theory is nothing but telling the truth about, about history, and that's why people are having these backlashes. And so mm -hmm. that was about um, Sally Hemming. 
Yes. And how much um, the way historians and Hollywood tries to say it was a romance between them. But it them, was not a romance. But it wasn't a romance. It was a rape. It was an ongoing rape for several years. Several years. And she was young and, and just they try to make it like somehow her love with him inspired Blossom, him yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know, made him feel guilty. But it's like he could have sold her anytime. He could have had her whipped. He could have had her sexually assaulted and, and by it, other slave owners. It, it just, the list goes on and on. And so I've been doing a lot of drawings in my sketchbooks, or I have been doing a lot of drawings in my sketchbooks of presidents of the United States and their mm -hmm. policies, how, what they, how they impacted us as a community. Let's face it, the first 11 were just slave owners straight out. Straight out, absolutely. So there's no point in even saying, oh, well, here's what they did for the black community. No, they no, were just they straight out no, slave no, they owners. Didn't do, they didn't do a thing. Yeah. They did not do a thing. Yeah. So that's why, that's one of the pages from the books where it was of one of the presidents. What made you decide to do political drawings and sketchings? Dana Chandler studying his work. Um, there's this British artist named Sue Coe, whose work I really enjoy as well. Um, Never heard of her. Is she black? No. Okay. She's, um, but her stuff is very political, very political. about um, things in the world. She had, she, did, she had illustrated a book on the life of Malcolm X that I thought was amazing. She did? Yeah, and I got to meet her. I, I can show you some of her work at some point. I would um, love to see it. I knew, see, initially, I, I, since I liked comic books so much as a kid, I wanted to draw superheroes and stuff and possibly do comic book superheroes. But I, um, when I got to college, I went to Boston University and I had this professor there named Floyd Barber, one of the best teachers I've ever had in my entire life. And he taught an African-American literature class and African-American history class. And these were the electives I kept taking. African-American literature classes? Yes. Wow, good. And so learning about all these different people in our history who I didn't learn when I was in high school, Thank you. a number of them. What it did for me was, do I really care about Superman or Batman or Spider-Man <laughs> yeah. as much as a Paul Robeson or yes. Josephine Baker yep. or some of these other people? How else, how else are other people gonna know they exist? So I took it upon myself for the last 30 something years that that's mostly what I focus on. Historical people and figures that often are ignored in the history History, books. and yeah. they are. Yeah. Very, very now, have you taken your works, your, your, your historical works of black folks that you've done, pro, you know, done sketches and put together, have you put them into book form? Yes. Do you have, do you, have you published? Yes. Okay, did not know that. Blurb.com, is this the camera I look at? Yep. You can get your copy from blurb.com. <laughs> There you go. Archives by Shea Justice. I, I call it Archives. Um, okay. Archives 1 and 2. And I'm currently working on Archives 3. Um, the first book is about a lot of historical people like you, we were just talking about. Um, situations that happen in the United States in terms of racism and, and police brutality and things like that that I've done in my sketchbooks and on piece, random pieces of paper. The other book is about um, a lot of pop cultural stuff. I'm a big fan of pop culture and Andy Warhol's work. Oh, so, you are. Oh, yeah. And Jean Michel Basquiat. And the kind of work that deals with, like, I don't know, stuff that I grew up with schoolhouse rock cartoons or um, certain TV shows and, and things mm -hmm. like that, but like Star Trek, science fiction, all these different things. So, the second book has a lot of that kind of work that, in it. So, yeah. I've separated them a little bit. Okay. But those are on blurb.com. Blurb.com. I'm going to yeah. look for those. Hmm? I, I said I'm going to look for those. No, you ain't, because I'm going to have them for you. Ah, okay. As a thank you for this. My, well, <laughs> you are so welcome. Yeah. My son would love to have your works. He's interested in, you know, historical and cultural, but, you know, black folks. Mm -hmm. And he wants to be able to teach his children that. They live in a community that isn't, well, now they're not, but they had lived in uh, Newton for a, a minute, mm -hmm. yeah, for about 10 years. And they, um, then, you know, they, their school, the schools that their children are in mm -hmm. don't teach anything. It's getting worse now oh, across the country. The country, yep. The one place they want to ban books by Toni Morrison, the other, other places, oh yeah. 
some places in many places in Texas, they try to um, change the official history books to say that black people that were brought here were brought as uh, workers. They don't want to use the word slaves anymore. Or um, in Texas, they want to have, I know the school committee got into a big thing at one of these places in Texas to, um, if you're going to talk about civil rights, you have to give opposing points of view. And I'm like, opposing points, points of, view, of view? Civil rights versus the Ku Klux, so the Ku Klux Klan get a voice? <laughs> How is that, that opposing is points of view? So is that, then I guess that's a form of American imperialism? It is big time. Because right now, critical race theory is the big boogeyman. And, and they're using it so that they, you ask a lot of people, well, what is it? Well, it makes white people feel bad, or it hurts people's feelings, or it separates the races, and it makes slavery feel bad. Considering okay. slavery existed for so long. Thank you, almost Jim Crow existed for, for so, so long. long. The prison industrial complex has existed. That, that and it's, it's like, still existing. And it still exists. It just changed its tentacles into something else. So when people try to say, well, we can't talk about it because it's going to hurt people's feelings, who cares? Care. Thank you. I, I never understood learning truth. Is if someone's feelings gets hurt, so what? I took you know. a class. Mm -hmm. I took a class on the people's history of the United States. Howard Zinn. He wrote that. I almost passed out. On the, I read that entire book from bottom, from beginning to end. Um, my client, one of my professors at Springfield, I, I'm a graduate of Springfield College, mm -hmm. and I took that class there. And when I read excerpts of that book, I said, huh? Like, I never knew, since we're talking about slavery and, you know, and white folks, and what they do and do not do, and about making them look bad, I never knew, that, never realized, or knew even, that Christopher Columbus left his guys, his people there on an island and went back to England, or oh, wherever the hell he came from. Spain. Spain, see, I forgot. That shows you how much I'm really interested in American history anymore. And that um, they wiped out an entire Arawak Indian culture. Yeah, he was a monster. I never. Because you only went by I, what you were taught. Yeah. And again, they, when I was in college, they said a lot of times with America, one of my professors, I remember specifically saying, America likes to look at its history and look at the world through a child's view, which is George really? Washington didn't tell no lies, chopped down the cherry tree. Okay. Lincoln was tall, freed the slaves, and then Martin Luther King came along and we're all good. And try to hide. The rest. Or, or say, or, or try to deprioritize it and, and not make it, make it important. I once said to a student when we were having a conversation similar to this, we're not that far removed from that history because Harriet Tubman died in the 20th century. Jeez. She died in like the early 1900s. 1900. Yes, she so did. I'm like, think about the connection or how, that's like my great, great grandmother, pretty much. You, you can't act as though, well, it was slavery, it was so long ago, or this was so long so ago. So long ago, it wasn't. When it's, it's coursing through our blood every day. Yes. And so when people say, oh, you're going to say it hurt people, or it's not going to bring people together, or why do, you, why do people always got to talk about slavery? I'm like, I don't think folks talked about it enough, enough to even understand what it was. Thank you. And if you don't understand what it was. was then how can you even begin to talk about it? Yeah, or say, let's stop let's talking stop about it. How are you going to say stop talking about it when we hurt. haven't even deep di dived into it? Thank you get you. all these Africans from another continent, bring them to America. Oh, please. Do you know? How'd you train them? How did you force them? You take away their religion, you take away their yes, self-esteem, you, you take, take away, their, away language, their language, culture, customs, and it's like, let's break this down system systematically. Systematically. Yes. There's a program that I'm watching called um, High Off the Hog. Mm -hmm. It's a show that's on YouTube. Okay. And the f and it's about how. America got its cuisine, their cooking and the stuff they eat. Got a feeling I know where this is going, but. <laughs> <laughs> got, a, got, got a feeling I know where this is going, but. 
no, you might not, because I watched it, and the first show that I, the first episode that I watched mm -hmm. was a young man from the United States that went to Africa. I forget where, what part of Africa, but he met a woman who had been there for, been there for years, studying the culture, studying the food, but then she took him to a shrine. Mm -hmm. And it's a, I want to call it a shrine, or maybe on that ground underneath, hundreds of slaves were buried. Wow. There's a big arch mm -hmm. on each side of the arch. There's an African man on one side and an African woman on another side. That's got to be painful to see something Low, like that. With chains. Mm -hmm on their arms. These are two, two sculptures. Mm -hmm. And when the young man went there and the woman took her, took, she's, a, she's a professor, and she took him there, the, he said, the, he's talking, and he said, the feelings that are coming over me, I can't explain. The spirits of those men, women, and children that never made it to the slave ships that were destroyed and killed and, and beaten. Yeah. Their, their, their bodies are under that. You can't even walk on that ground with your shoes on. Man, that's gotta be harsh. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. I stood there and I just, I said, I don't think I can watch much more of this. Because mm -hmm. that's how it really, I started to cry. I would. I started to cry. I said, oh, you know. But those are the stories that shouldn't be ignored. I don't care whose feelings get offended. Get hurt. Thank yeah, you. I, I don't care. Those stories, they're our stories. They're just as valid as their stories or anyone else's. Yes. And I refuse to not explore it in my work, like what we were looking like you at. Were doing. Some of the stuff. Yeah. Yes, you can and we're going to do more. We're going to do more. Okay. Matter of fact, we are going to, in about oh, 45 seconds, we're going we're gonna to take a break. Okay. And when we take our break, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about more of your work. And we're going to continue that conversation that we are having. Mm -hmm. So please wait and come back with us. We shall be back. We're taking a short break. Okay. What's more dangerous, a man who isn't afraid of death or one who's found everything to live for? I asked him if he was proud of me. He emphatically said yes as he laid his pecan-colored head on my chest. And I went through my mind a thousand times to figure out what that could possibly mean. And every single example ended in motivation for me. So you may not be afraid to die, but I'm more afraid to let them down. And I found something to live for, which is a dangerous motive forever fueled. See, your thoughts may be involuntary, but my actions are very calculated. I was a man with a plan, but now I'm a dad with a decree, and you can't take that from me. My sons ain't raised by no coward, and they won't be one either. If this be the measure of a man, the yardstick gonna need way more meters. I take it too far, so they never come up short, because I found everything to live for. Welcome. Welcome back to Artists of Color. I'm Elaine Hall Corbin, your host, and we have with us, or I have with me today, uh, Mr. I call him Mr. Shea Justice, an, an amazing <laughs> artist and educator. Thank you. Thank I'm you glad you're with us. We are having an amazing conversation here. I mean, mm -hmm. art and history and politics, and racism life. and politics, yes, mm -hmm. which is great. Yes. Because we're going to talk about our next. Um, picture that we're going to bring up that you've your next piece of work on okay. W.E.B. Du Bois. Sure. And I want to know, we're going to talk about the history behind that. Um, I did this, um, I started doing a series of pieces on copies of the Constitution, Articles of Confederation, um, Abraham Lincoln's uh, Gettysburg Address. I, I've been getting copies of a lot of them and drawing on them and using them as things to sculpt and, or put images into. Images. 
And I decided to do one of Dubois that's part marker, uh, pencil, as well as acrylic paint. Oh. And what I've been doing is looking at some of the things that are in the Constitution or written by the founding fathers of this nation and the hypocrisy okay. that goes with how, you know, over the last several years, several hundred years, yeah. the hypocrisy that goes into a lot of it. So I end up incorporating a lot of that into the um, pictures, into the picture. So if you could show it again. So if you look, you'll see like in text up there, gay rights. Um, we're supposed to have human rights, but yet there was long periods of time where there was sterilization against black people, particularly those of us who may have been incarcerated yes. or the Tuskegee experiment, the experiment, syphilis experiment oh my gosh, and things yes. like that. And then at the bottom, I have it where it says democracy. It's not for everyone because it it's always not. seems to be even now with all the fights over voting rights and things like that across the United States. There's always someone trying to pull it away from us, even though we've pretty much done a lot of legwork to make democracy Not, what it what was, it is, what, what it, it is. What it is. The civil rights movement, Dr. Mm -hmm. King, all these other people who have done mm -hmm. things to help at least get us the right to vote and get us beyond where we were with second class status. Right. And yet Absolutely. there's always this pushback. Pull, yeah. 2021, Texas and, and all these different states Florida, are coming up with these laws. Georgia, mm-hmm. Yeah. And in this denial about how the election came out, turned out, the denial is really because too many black people came out and voted. There you go. <laughs> That's what that is. That's why it's That's like, you can call it QAnon, conspiracy, or this, that. No, too many black people came out and voted. And they didn't like that. And now all of a sudden, we got to start changing the laws, make the lines longer, longer. so that you go home because your feet are tired. You go to jail if you hand someone a bottled water. Well, yes. It just... That's what it's, it's... Or, or we've got to take and recount two or three times for the amount of votes because... They ain't right. And we're going to keep suing in the hopes that someone will just throw us a bone and let us win. Mm -hmm. And it makes me angry at some, not angry, but frustrated sometimes when I've had conversations with people who just say, I just don't vote. It's all the same. I don't vote. And I'm like, if, it, if your vote didn't matter, people wouldn't be spending all this time and effort to pull it away from you. Thank There's a value in it. Yes, so when people is. are like, I don't vote because the, the politicians are all the same. It's like, no, they're not all no, the same. No, they're not all the same. But you yeah. know, it's interesting because I voted, I almost didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I have been voting since I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And this year's mayoral election, mm -hmm. uh, I, I was very, very concerned, still am, mm -hmm. right now, even though the Ms. person Owl. that is in is in. Mm -hmm. But we also have to talk about our young mayor, black woman that we had for what, six months? Kim Janey, yeah. Kim. And the work that she's done, has still mm -hmm. tried to do. I'm, a, I'm afraid of the fact that, that all that work is going to be turned over and rug, run, stuffed under the rug by the new mayor. I'm taking a wait and see attitude. You are? I, I have the same feeling. Okay. But I also feel like, does the mayor job matter anymore considering it feels like the construction industry and the colleges that are gentrifying all these neighborhoods, they, seem to, have the they seem to have the final word and they're just building and building and building and displacing and displacing. And I'm like, is, is, is any mayor gonna be capable of stopping this? Yeah, or yeah, at least making some affordable housing? housing? So yes. I, I, that, I take I, a wait and see attitude with um, yeah, I guess, Michelle Bull. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold back and see. I, I too am going to hold back and see. Because yeah. like you just said, all the gentrification, all these two by four high rise expensive buildings that only 10% of them can you put people like us in. And a lot of them don't even match the neighborhoods. They're like these big glass weird George Jetson looking structures next to a regular house that's existed for like over 40 oh, years. Thank you. It, I'm like, it doesn't even match up right. In the no, it doesn't. So, so I don't understand. Especially near Ashmont Station, I noticed oh, that. Oh, yeah. me too. Yeah, especially near Ashmont Station, I've noticed that. Me too. Oh. Did you want to see another one? Yeah, or? I think we're going to bring up another. Okay. Here we go. Um, 
This was during the... Uh, yeah, tell me about I didn't. I was trying to understand this one. This was during the uh, protest that uh, happened. This was in one of, one of my sketchbooks. This was during the protest where uh, the young woman was killed and it was that rally in North Carolina or whatever. Oh, yes. And Donald Trump said there's very fine people on both sides. Um, the man on the far left is uh, General Robert E. Lee's great great grandson. And what? even he, yes, and even he said, take the statue down. There's no point. They kicked him out of his church over it, too, because he's a minister. But even he said, it's just dumb. That statue should have been come down. Wow. Um, okay. Robert E. Lee's. I Lee noticed that when Trump, because these, these are pages from when Trump was in office. <laughs> um, GOP <laughs> can't kick racism addiction. U.S. rescinded the grants to combat extremism of right wing groups. Even though the government has said over and over again, the biggest threat is not Muslims in the United States, it's these far racist right wing right white wing, supremacist that's groups. That's right. And when Trump was in, it was like, oh no, we're not gonna do any research on that. No, and so no. we're not gonna put any resources towards combating me. that. Um, so I'll, sometimes what I'll do is when I'm done reading a lot of newspapers and articles, I'll write my thoughts about certain things. If I don't sketch it, I sometimes cut, paste, and just glue them into the, in my sketchbook pages. Oh, okay. And then these are some of the things that are in the books that I've been doing, like the book I was telling you about earlier. Oh. Is I put them in the book. You put them, um. Yeah. Gotta have a book. Yeah. Now, we all know Ma Rainey. That is Ma Rainey. I did this piece. That's the real Ma Rainey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did this piece about 15, 16 years ago. You um, mean before this movie came out? Yeah. Yeah, this was about 16 years ago. And um, I, I, it probably, I would even say it was probably 20 years ago because I'm looking at the pen and ink technique I, I did on that. So I'm like, yeah, I was pro it was probably 20 years ago. Um, big fan of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, um, one of my favorite August Wilson plays. And they turned it into a movie Mo and stuff like I that. I didn't yeah. even know he had done that until I saw it and saw that it was done by... August Wilson, he who is my fate. I love that man. Oh, the piano he, lesson. Yes. Yeah, with Boy Willie and stuff like that. Fences. Oh, God, Denzel tore that up. Didn't he? When he was in that. <laughs> but Ma Rainey um, always was fascinated by her. But also, um, as I was saying to you earlier, I had a professor in college, um, Professor Barber, who taught to African-American literature class, yes. where I read some of these books. And sometimes he would encourage me to illustrate some of the people in the books instead oh, really? of just instead of just writing the papers illustrate illustrate and then of course he got to keep the pictures afterwards <laughs> I wanted an A so yeah he got to keep the pictures <laughs> okay but he would love to um, encourage me I remember illustrating characters from third life of Grange Turner um, Joe Turner's coming Joe no Turner. I'm sorry Th third life of Grange Copeland and Joe Turner's come and gone. gone and he would just have me illustrate the stories for him and I got to display them in class and show them to my classmates and all that. So I just loved doing that. Oh, I know you did. Oh yeah. Loved reading the books, but just loved that it was like, I get to illustrate the books See? just for this teacher, so. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Was there? What have we got coming? Let's see what's next. Uh, okay. Oh, yes. This was my sketchbook thing of how angry and disgusted I was that that woman is still alive and is not in jail and that she had admitted to a reporter she had lied. Lied. Now, for years, you always heard about, oh, he whistled at her or said, yeah, baby, or said something disrespectful to this Never, woman. That was not the case. His cousin said he had whistled, but it was clear he wasn't whistling at, at her. her. But he she took it. He was whistling. Yeah, and, and they left and ran because she probably got startled or something. And then she said he tried to grab her, and he told her he had been with a bunch of white women, all this other stuff. And it what? was like, oh, yeah, her testimony was awful. Oh, I never heard this. And they did all this and beat him to death. Some of the people involved are still alive. Yes, they are. And should have been brought to justice a long time ago. And so I drew him. I saved the article um, because she, all of a sudden now she knows... Um, her time is limited. She only got a couple of years left to yes. live. So she's probably hoping she can sneak her way into heaven, but I hope she burns <laughs> in someplace else. Okay. Because she tried, I think she lost a son and she wanted to contact his mother before his mother died to, to show some sort of empathy towards what? his mother. Yeah. 
I was like, no. No, no. not happening. No. no. Not happening. And so the guy pointing, saying there he is, is his uncle, who testified in the that, trial. Mm -hmm. And then they had to get him out of town because he was going to get killed. And so that's why I put the illustrations together. And again, that's in one of my sketchbooks. Okay. So a lot of times his, histor historical events that happen now, as it relates to back, back then, then, I immediately start bringing it together you, in a lot of my, my, the things that I write and draw. Oh, boy. Yeah. Does your artwork always center around politics? No. There, are there some pieces that you've done that, I'm not sure if I have one here, but are um, there some that are, oh, well, let's talk about this one. That is one of the, Isn't 54th, one of the 54th Regiment yeah. reenactors. Oh, that's one of the, who is that? Say, I know most of those guys. I can't remember. This was, I did this some years back. Okay. Um, they were at the state house and hanging out. And what I yep. usually do is I'll just sit there when they're not hanging out, but they were doing some sort of formal, formal presentation to the yes. public and stuff that I'll just sit there and I'll start drawing them. And I don't really say anything about it mm. or bother them. I'm just like, I'll just render them. I have a lot of respect for, um, those of us in the military who made these sacrifices, sacrifices. like yesterday was Veterans Day and stuff. Yes. Um, particularly black people, because we had to come home, World War I, they would lynch us in our uniforms. Yes, they would. The, the, the segregation against us in World War II okay. until Truman came along and was like, y'all gotta stop with this. And just, there's so many stories of perseverance and success to that prove means. we're just as good as white men. Uh, okay. And I just have a lot of respect for that. I've never done military service, but I respect the them. men and women who have. Have you ever heard of the, what is it? The 6888? The what? The 6888. No. Well, you know there is the Roxbury International Film Festival. Mm -hmm. That's every year. Last year, no, this year. Okay, it is now November. Mm -hmm. Six, this year, there was a film called the Six Triple Eight. Mm -hmm. They were a battalion of black women who during, during the Korean War that was sent to France and, I think it was France and Germany mm -hmm. because the mail was so piled up mm -hmm. that none of our servicemen were getting their mail black, white, green, blue, none of the servicemen were getting their mail mm -hmm. from home. And it had gotten to the point that the morale of our servicemen had gone down. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. They, um, I forget how it went. I've seen the film, mm -hmm. and I'm putting together a piece on it. They um, sent 500, a battalion, they called the six, the, the six triple eight. They were a battalion of 500 black women wax. Mm -hmm. And they, when they were sent there, they had a white commander. She was very nasty towards them all the time. 1950s career. Yeah. Not surprising. We, we, Slightly pre-civil rights. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. A couple of, uh, three, um, uh, three of them were attacked. Mm -hmm. Um, two of them died in a car accident. Wow. Yeah. They never could say how the accident happened. But they claimed, but the, I'm saying this to say all of this, they claimed that these women mm -hmm. could not get the mail out. The mail was so piled up, it was piled up to the ceilings in two barracks. Wow. In two different countries. And this is a documentary. It's a doc. Yes. I want to remind me of it when we're done because I'm going to go check it out. That's they, very interesting. They um. They got that mail out within six months. The United States Army could not believe that they didn't. They, they can't do that. They'll, it's going to take them two years, three years to get that mail out. They got that mail out in six months. That's worth a movie. Yes, it just is, like, isn't it? Just like Hidden Figures. Okay. John Glenn wouldn't have been in space. 
if it wasn't for those sisters. It's oh. like, it's worth a movie. Yes, it is. Very compelling. Yeah. I thought you, I, since we're talking about the 54th, I said, let me, let me just bring this up because I thought you would, re yeah, I was, ex it was an amazing, it's amazing documentary. I want to go back to something you asked me about, do I do other things? Yes. Um, landscapes. Oh, okay. Um, I live near Jamaica Pond. Right. Um, when I was recovering, I was in a car accident in February. Um, when I was, during the period I was in recovery, I would go there and I would do watercolors of the ducks, the birds, and the oh. land over there. Oh, wow. I love going to Franklin Park Zoo and I'll draw the animals you there. You draw the animals? Yeah. Okay, okay. I, I never really show them because I've never had the opportunity. No one's asked me, oh, let's have an exhibit of Shay's drawings of animals, animals. or Shay's <laughs> drawings of, you know, <gasps> toys. Mean... Toys, dolls, action figures, and, and things from the 70s and stuff. And I, I do a lot of three-dimensional collage work too. It's just, I haven't really exhibited that stuff yet. All right, do you do commissions? Yeah. Have you been commissioned? Hmm? You have, okay. Not recently, but in the Not past, recently. a bunch of times. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, we yeah. need to talk about the uh, uh, your last piece. Uh, there we go, Eartha Kitt. Tell us about that one. Oh God, I love this. I did this <laughs> years ago. If you look, if you notice what she's wearing, she's wearing her um, Catwoman mask. Yes, I know. I, I, that, that's who show. I knew. I said I know who that is. And I did this because. There was that situation, that incident that happened at the White House luncheon with Lyndon Baines Johnson's wife. And she was there with all these ladies talking and having this conversation. And Lyndon Baines Johnson's wife, he was president at the time, his wife, Lady Bird, oh, was saying, geez. I don't understand why these Negroes are running through the streets or doing this, doing that, and all this. And she ended up responding, if you wasn't sending them off to war and helping them get a good education and jobs, this is what happened. And the woman started to cry. Lyndon Johnson got so mad, he sick the CIA on her, FBI on her. And she had to, he did what? And she had to leave the United States. That's why she... So she was gone for years. So yes. if, can you bring the picture back up again? Yes. So what you see there, where she says the only thing that hurt them, I was telling the truth. I saved the article, and part of the reason I saved it and put it in this collage form is, number one, I love her to death. Had the coolest voice and loved I seeing know she did. Anna Lucasta with Sammy Davis Jr. Loved yep. the movie. But... Um, it's, it's, it's one of these things where you, f I find articles that I, f that I think would be interesting and relevant. I liked, like I said, superhero Batman and all that kind of stuff. And she was such a fascinating person that I just start saving some of the articles, cutting and pasting and then drawing things around it so that if you're compelled by the image, you'll be compelled by what she's saying and how I laid it out in terms of the text and the incident that had happened. Happens. I never knew about that incident. Well, now you know. You I'd are not kidding. That. Now <laughs> I know. Knowing is half the battle. Knowing is half the battle. Oh, my gosh. There's a lot of things that we don't know, or, or you know, the media doesn't shine lights on it much no. and things like that, but Eddie Murphy and them basically brought her back. If you remember that film, Boomerang. Oh, yes. You remember that? Marcus, sure I'm not wearing any panties or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was like, they celebrated her and it was brought her back. But for the longest time, she was only big over in Europe because of true. what he had done to her. Daughter. Wow. Yeah. I never knew about that. Mm -hmm. Unreal. Was there any others? Or did you want to? Um, no, well, we, you know, we've got a few here. So okay. let's, let's I didn't know what the time, so that's why. So, yeah, we've got a few minutes. Okay. What is your, I want to say, I usually ask this to most of my artists when mm -hmm. I have them, but you, I'm not sure how to ask this question, which is your future as an artist. My future as an artist. I'm working on a book now, it's going to be hardcover, about uh, a half century of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm 51. And so the things that I observed and noticed as a small child that inspired me to get through the creative journey of my life. And a lot of it deals with my grandparents in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and my family in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, that's where we're from originally. Okay. When I used to go to my grandfather's house or grand, and, and walk, when you walk through the front door and we'd get yelled at, we kids, if you let that door slam. Uh -huh. There was a long hallway that led to the kitchen. 
to the left was the stairs that went upstairs to the bedrooms. So as a small child, when you first walked in, because my grandfather and grandmother were also antique collectors, they collected a lot of things and displayed it all over the house. Oh. So for me, it was a visual yes. oasis. He had a display box when you first walked in to the left that had all of these political buttons on it. And you could just turn the box and you could see all these different candidates for all these different offices for president and things like that. So I'm five, four years old. And I can remember as a little kid constantly looking at it and trying to learn how to enunciate names like Richard Milhouse Nixon or, <laughs> you know, Lyndon Baines Johnson, Johnson and all this other stuff. And just seeing these buttons and all that stuff. And just his National Geographics he had. Oh, I loved National Geographics. Jet magazines and, and, and things like that, that. And he had so many kind of antique toys and things like that, that it was so inspiring to me creatively, trying to draw some of it, trying to understand some of it. So it, it, to acknowledge that, a lot of times I think when people talk to artists and they ask about what inspired you or what, um, who inspired you? Inspired. One of the first things we do, or a lot of artists will do, is we'll talk about, oh, I was inspired by Andy Warhol, or I was inspired by Picasso, or this person, that person. I like to also talk about the human beings who I knew who inspired me. Okay. And so I want to acknowledge them in this book I'm working on and how much it inspired me, because if I didn't know, like a friend of mine's named Susan Musinski, if I didn't know her for like over 20 years and went to the summer camp with her that dealt with racism and homophobia and all this oh, other wow. stuff. And this was, I've been friends with her since I was like 19. Okay. It's, it's such, it's so inspiring in terms of some of the things I've done that I would want to acknowledge her before I acknowledge, oh, I did this technique from Romare Bearden or from that person and things like that. I like to acknowledge the people I've known. And that's I something I try that. to do. Yeah, yeah that, that's what I like to do. Yeah, that, wow. I hope I answered that's it. That's profound. You have, <laughs> that is a very <laughs> profound answer. Yeah, I hope I answered it. Because it know. did. That's, My hey. future as an artist, but you asked that. I also would like to, as you all know, since 1993 when we started, when Bush started the war on terror and the invasion of Afghanistan and yes. Iraq and everything happened, I started writing and drawing on these rice paper scrolls, um, illustrating day to day or month to month the impact of the war on us as a culture. For instance, the surplus of military equipment and hardware during that time period, because after 9-11, they wrote the government basically a blank check. Buy whatever you want is a war yes. on terror. No country is safe. And a lot of the surplus hardware and weapons, you know where a lot of it went that they didn't need? police stations across the United States, what? which is why you see a lot of cops is that paramilitary why? gear. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so the opioid epidemic, the biggest supply of opioids that you're going to get in the world is in Afghanistan. So why would it not be the longest war in American America. history? So I've been working on this scroll all these years, and if I laid it out in their entirety, it would be probably almost two miles. And I've just continued working on it. Even though Joe Biden just recently took us out of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. I have some books I want to read to do a finale of what it was all about, what it became. Okay. Ultimately, I'd like to display it in the Smithsonian or Museum of African American History or something like that. I'd like to do that. I recently had much of it on display at Spoke Gallery, oh, but wow. we weren't able to show them in their entirety okay. because the gallery is not that large. Oh, it's not? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is a gallery in South Boston. It used to be Medicine Wheel, and now they had to move, so now they're Spoke oh, Gallery. Oh, that used to be Medicine Wheel. Yeah. I know, I remember Medicine Wheel. Kathleen Batetti? Yes. Oh, she's awesome. She interviewed yes. me at the reception, so she's wonderful. Fantastic. So ultimately, as an artist, that's, that's something I want to do. Um, and figure things out as I go along. Just glad to be in future, try to be in some future exhibitions at some point. Because okay. this one at Spoke Gallery is my first solo exhibition. I was going to ask years. you about solo, yeah. It was my first in years. I, I usually do groups. I, um, uh, for some, and it's not even like I try to. Just by chance, I just end up doing group shows or being in group shows. A man who isn't afraid Beautiful. of death or yeah. one who's found everything. Well, Shay, mm -hmm. it's been an amazing <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> I loved, we have gone from art to politics to history, 
back to art, what you're going to be doing, the fact that you've written a book, you know, three books. It's stop, been wonderful stop. having you. <laughs> Thank I you. I really love having you. We're going to do this again. I would love to. Yes. A lot of things I, I would have loved to have mentioned. Got to mention how much I love my mom, my brother, my sister, oh, my family, my Aunt Jane, my cousins, and everyone. So. I know. All we pay, I do that stuff. Dope. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you to my audience. I'm Elaine Hall Corbin, your host. Thank you for being with us this afternoon on Artists of Color. And come back and visit us again. We'll be back on the 10th of December. And I'll tell you who my special surprise guest will be then. Have a great afternoon. Stay out of the rain. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. Stay out of the rain.